Dave Palumbo for Muscle Serpents Daily here, guys. It's Thursday morning, and I'm out here with Andy Hall, my anaconda, my green anaconda, that is, out here in the natural daylight, which makes her so much more, uh, I guess you could say, iridescent. You can see her real great color she's got. She's growing, I'll tell you that much, but she has not eaten a single rodent yet. I give her chicks, baby frozen chicks. And, you know, anacondas in the wild are, are bird eaters. A lot of people don't realize that especially when they're younger. And, you know, eventually we would love to switch them up to rodents because it's easier and they'll grow better. But the truth is, you know what? You, you don't have to worry about that. Snakes are opportunistic feeders. They don't always have to eat the same thing. So even though it's, it, she'll grow better with, with, you know, rats and stuff like that, what I'm doing is I'm feeding her chicks as long as she wants to eat them. And I always, I'll test her out. I'll, I'll throw a rodent in there and just see if she's interested in it. If not, I don't worry about it because you know what? When she hits a certain size, her body's going to demand more nutrition, and I guarantee you she'll just instinctually start eating rodents. I, I just know that's the case, and that's what's going to happen. They do that in the wild. They change over their food types all the time. It's like a human. You know, I, my kids now are into eating, you know, uh, white bread all of a sudden. They want white bread for everything. Before that, they were, my son was eating actually salmon with me. Now he won't even touch a piece of fish. Kids and bot, our bodies instinctually know what they need. And so do these snakes. So uh, I'm just going to enjoy her. If she wants to eat chicks, she can eat chicks for now. And eventually, uh, she'll move on to bigger prey items as she gets older. But that's really what I want to talk to you about today. It's about being instinctual with your animals, you know, and not worrying sometimes about, oh my God, are they eating every single week? Or are they, are they, are they can I see the ovulation in my breeding behaviors? Uh, am I seeing locks? these animals will do what they're going to do. If you put them together and you create the right environment, all you can do is hope that they do the right thing. And sometimes, you know, you walk out of your snake room, you're like, oh man, I'm, I'm going to get no babies this year. I don't see locks. I'm not seeing everyone else is posting pictures and you're getting yourself stressed out. I don't worry about that kind of stuff. <laughs> I learned eventually these animals are going to do what they're going to do. So let's go into the snake room. Let's take a look. Maybe we'll catch um, some behaviors, and I'll show you a couple more holdbacks. I know a lot of people have been asking about the ball python holdbacks. I want to show you some azanthics because the azanthic line is really cool, and there's several lines of that in ball pythons, and I'm going to show you the VPI line. Let's check it out. All right, guys, I'm going to talk to you today about the VPI azanthic line, okay, of ball pythons. Uh, azanthic is a, a line of uh, recessive mutation that removes yellows. Okay, you get, kind of get that black and whitish looking animal. It takes the color out of it, so to speak, especially since ball pythons have a lot of yellows in them. There's several different lines of, of uh, azanthic. I work with the uh, TSK or the Snake Keeper line uh, with my snows. Uh, I have this VPI line uh, that I'm going to show you in a minute. And then there's a Joliff line. And, uh, and then there's, uh, you know, there's another line up in Canada that uh, Marcus uh, Jane Reptiles uh, also found it as well and they all seem to not be compatible. So you breed them together, you get double heads. You don't get um, compatibility. But this VPI line is really nice. Here's a, um, a VPI azanthic I produced and a VPI fire azanthic. All right, so the fire lightens them up a little bit. They're pretty similar. This one you could tell is just the VPI azanthic right here on my right hand, this one right here that won't sit still for me. And this little boy, is available. And here's my VPI Azanthic Fire. And once again, this is two genes. This is one. The, AB, uh, the VPI Azanthic is recessive. The fire is incomplete dominant. And you get a slightly different look to it. Obviously, this is a little bit of a lighter snake. Now, let's take this one step further. These are two girls I produced. These are VPI Azanthic Fire bamboos. You can see the bamboo pattern distribution or that pattern mutation along the dorsal stripe here and what this is doing is it's just changing the way the snake normally looks its saddles. You can see how light this snake is. That's the fire in there and then the azanthic takes out the yellows or pretty much all the yellows, not, not quite all of them. And this to me was the, you know, I bred a, the parents were a VPI azanthic fire it was the female and the male was a VPI bamboo. So we kind of hit all the genes here. This is VPI azanthic fire and bamboo and I produced a girl here I think they're both I think they're both the same these girls and I originally thought that maybe this one was lacking fire because this one looks a little lighter 
but I think they both have I think they both have fire in them as well. Um, just really cool looking. I, I like the azanthic lines. Oh, they don't like each other, huh? Look at that. Face off. Dun, 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 dun. All right, here's a here's a um, pied ball python that's also a hundred percent head albino um, that I produced this past year. She's she's growing really really nicely now. Um, really nice colors in that pied. I almost thought it was there was more than just pied in here, but it's a low white pied, which I prefer actually. I like to see some some pattern. I like to just see the little interspersed white amounts in there. Um, sometimes you, you remove so much of the pattern that it just looks like a white snake and you don't really see very much. So this is a really nice low white pied. And then here is the, uh, here's a male I produced. This is the visual albino pied. So you can see the difference. Pied, albino pied, you take away the melanin, you produce this. This boy is, is gorgeous. Um, he will be available for sale uh, eventually. But um, you can see that, that distinction. To me, the, the albino pieds are just some of my favorites, you know. I think they became more people started producing them, so they kind of like initially they were really in high demand, and then people were like, "Oh well, I've seen them," you know, other people have. But to me, it's still if you're looking for just a, an impressive looking snake, a lot of people just like albinos, but albino pied is is exquisite. And I mean, the regular pieds are really nice. Just see that distinction. I mean, between the two of these right here. I mean, this is this is like uh, the dark side and the light side, right? If you want to, yeah, you know, I have to stick to my Star Wars analogies here. But there you go. Here's another clutch that I really like. It was a GHI Mojave. I bred to a Mojave. Here is a GHI female that I produced. It, GHI is, is one of my favorite morphs. It's really dark. And I wanted to show you what the single gene looked like because it is, it, you know, we all see GHI Mojaves and they look kind of cool. The GHI is just a very, very, very dark snake. And I mean, there's so much, you know, contrast in here and the golds. And that's why so much, that's why this gene looks so good when you mix it in with light stuff, because it just, it adds even more contrast. Now, take this, and you throw the Mojave in there, okay, and we, produ we produce the GHI Mojave, which is probably one of the, the, the greatest, you know, two gene morphs out there. Uh, this has just got Mojave added. Look at these little streaks. The, it looks like someone took a, a gold paintbrush and just painted that on there. So this is GHI, GHI Mojave. And then you go one step further than that, and you put two copies of the Mojave gene, and you get the totally unexpected, right? A white snake with blue eyes. I mean, look at that. that that's a super Mojave right here. Once again, I just fed these guys yesterday, so they're kind of pissed off that I'm handling them. But super Mojave. Now, this could be a super GHI Mojave even. We're not sure, you know, until you breed them out. A lot of people say, oh, put a UV light on them. You can see the pattern. I don't know. It never works for me. But this is... Certainly a Super Mojave. Look at those blue eyes. I mean, how much better and nicer does it get? The Super Mojaves, to me, are, are probably the, the best-looking um, blue-eyed leucistics that, that we have in the ball python uh, industry. I love them. They have a little bit of purple on their heads. This could also have GHI in it. We don't know until it will breed it out. But the Super Mojave is one of the snakes that I really can't keep. Once I list these, they get sold instantaneously. Because who doesn't want to have this as a pet? Someone comes over, oh, let me see a snake, and you show them a blue-eyed white snake. Exquisite. All right, we're going to end today's video, guys, with a lock that is really exciting for me. It is two boas that I, I wanted to see lock for a long time. This is a scoria that is also hypo and jungle. It's a female. And she's also 100% het sharp albino. And she's being bred by my Paradigm Blood Mail. You can see the lock, if you look at the tails locked together there. Um, it's pretty exciting, because we potentially could produce some sharp albino scorias, and or, okay, because remember the Paradigm is either, has both the sharp albino and it also has the bow caramel. We could actually produce some Paradigm scorias as well, which would be really cool. And of course the hypogene would be in there, which would make them sun glows. And the jungle gene is there. Who knows what that's going to do, right? So we, there's a lot of potential here. She's kind of a small girl, but she's pretty girthy. And she, you know what? And she's, her age is good. So I said, you know what? I was going to try it and see if they bred. I, if they didn't, I would be like, oh, well. But they, they locked up, and I got super excited when I saw it. I said, who knows? Maybe we'll get a good viable litter. I don't know. Maybe we'll get nothing. I, once again... This is the excitement of boa breeding. Sometimes the snakes you least expect it to breed, breed, 
And then other times I come in, I got huge snakes. I'll show you some of these snakes I got. I walk in, I get these humongous snakes together, and no one is locked. They just, they're just kind of laying together and doing nothing. I don't know why it happens. I can't get my fire diamonds to lock. Look at this. I got a beautiful white, <laughs> black-eyed leucistic super fire, and I got a, I got a male, and, and they don't want anything to do with each other. So I don't know. You know, you can't let that stuff depress you because... Maybe when I'm sleeping at night, they're locked up. I don't know. Maybe it's just not meant to be. You, if, when you breed snakes, you have to understand that you're not in charge. You can just create the environment, create the conditions, lower your temperatures in the room, do everything to set up the ideal situation to create breeding behavior and hopefully babies. And if it happens, thank the Lord up there or whoever creates that stuff because you know what? You're lucky in a sense and that it was meant to be. If it doesn't happen, there's always next year. That's why as snake breeders, we have so many snakes, because we have to hedge our bets, because if one doesn't work out, hopefully the other project will work out. You know, last year, I, I, I got some good boa litters. I didn't get all the ones I wanted, but I got enough of the good stuff that it overrided the fact that maybe I, I missed out on a few good things. Like, I didn't get any super fires, which is what I wanted to do for the first time. It didn't happen, but I got a lot of other good stuff, so it kind of overrode that, and I said, okay, I'll try again this year. And that's how snake breeding works. You create the conditions, you put the snakes together, and let them do their thing, and whatever happens, happens. And you try to celebrate and appreciate the good stuff that happens, and don't worry about the bad stuff. Because all of us breeders have bad stuff happen on a regular basis. We all lose snakes, we screw clutches up, we, we, we do bad things to eggs that we shouldn't have done by accident, and we learn from those mistakes. Hopefully we don't duplicate it. That's the key. It's a learning process. I'm learning. Hopefully you guys are learning. I learn from watching your mistakes. You guys learn from watching my mistakes. And hopefully we become better breeders for it. All right, I hope you guys are enjoying all the programming. If you are, hit that subscribe button, turn on your notifications, hit the like button, and we'll see you back tomorrow morning.